Welcome back to our live coverage of the United Nations Climate Talks. We're coming to you from Durban in South Africa. I'm delighted to have been joined by Oliver Morris of the International National Trust Organization. Um, so I guess, Oliver, the, the most obvious place to kick off is to ask you what that organization is and what do you do? Right. Well, the International National, National Trust Organization is mm. the umbrella body for all the national and heritage trusts around the world who have joined us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about, um, we have just under 60 members now and almost every continent is represented with sadly with the exception at the moment the Middle East and South America mm -hmm. but we are working very hard to try and uh, get them on board as well. And what do these organizations do? They protect the, mostly they protect the cultural heritage and the natural heritage of their countries or their regions uh, both tangible and intangible. Okay. Uh, in other words, they're not just protecting uh, historic buildings, for example, but they are actually protecting uh, some of those very cultures themselves. But this might just be my, my stereotype of these kinds of organisations, but in the UK at least they tend to be quite conservative, they tend to be kind of big institutions, um, or maybe this is just a UK thing, but it's not necessarily the kinds of organisations that you'd expect to be at the forefront of dealing with climate change. Why is it that you're, you're taking such a, a leading role in this? Well, because we feel very strongly, uh, well, well, to answer your, your first point, uh, you, you can be forgiven for thinking <laughs> about the stereotypical National Trust based on the UK model. And uh, in, it's fair to say that many of the National Trusts around the world are based on that very model. But having said that, uh, there are an awful lot of organisations out there that actually are not based on that model and they're nothing to do with colonialization or the, 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 the British colonies at all. They, for example, we have membership in Korea, in Taiwan, in China, in Ethiopia. Um, did I say Taiwan? I may have done um, Swaz Swaziland. No, I'm to be careful because that was. Uh, and so on. But, but all, all over the world, there, there are, some of them, yes, are, are very British, like um, United States, although they might argue against that. They have their own National Trust for Historic Preservation. India has uh, a, a one as well. And in Europe, a number of uh, European countries as well, which mm -hmm. are, are non-British. So, yeah, they're, they're not all based on, on the British model. Um, but wh and why are they so worried about climate change? Why is this something that you're, you're really pushing forward with? I think the, the concern with all of us within the National Trust movement is that the insufficient talk uh, is given at these climate conferences, and this is the third one we've attended now, by world leaders about the effect of climate change on cultural heritage and the cultures. It is never mentioned, frankly. And wherever uh, all the meetings that I go to, it, it, it hardly gets mentioned. And today, in fact, at a briefing I went to, somebody stood up and did talk about uh, the effect of climate change on cultures. And I spoke to him afterwards and said, I bully for you, you're the first person I've ever heard use the word culture in these mm -hmm. conferences. It's amazing. But when you, when you hear about climate change and when you see it on TV, it's about polar bears or it's about people a long way away, you know, something vague happening to them and it's not great news, but it's not a concern for rich people in rich countries. This is the, this is the stereotype. Why, why are you trying to approach this differently? Why do you feel differently? Well, I think, that you, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think people in, in, the, in the developed world are not taking sufficient notice about this. And it, it isn't just polar bears, it's people. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are dying daily as a result of climate change. And, and here we are in Africa. It's an enormous issue in Africa. We've got a member in Uganda. And in Uganda, there are all sorts of problems going on. I mean, the snow is melting fast on the Mount Renzori range. Uh, that's affecting the tribes below the mountain who believe the snow gods live up there. It's because there's much less water coming down off the mountain now, the whole agricultural economy is being affected. And that's coupled with these much longer droughts and much heavier rainfalls. And they can't grow the seed because either because it burns up in the drought or because it gets flooded out by the rain. So, you know, and these are huge issues. So the, the agricultural community is suffering as well. And what are the implications for, for example, a tribal community who, who believe that the, the snow on the top of a mountain is, is determined by, you know, it, it's spiritual for them? What are the implications of these changing for their way of life? 
Well, that's a question which I'd, I can't answer, but um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm highlighting that as an example mm -hmm. of one of the things that is, that is going on, which is directly affecting cultures. The same could be said of the Andes, the same can be said in Bangladesh with sea level rising. The fishermen are being driven out of their area because sea levels are rising and, and the, the wetland, they have to go much further out to sea now in order to fish because the shallow waters that have been submerged whole cultures are going to disappear at, the rate, at this rate um, in, in Kiribati and uh, Tuvalu and other small island states. Mm -hmm. um, in the Caribbean that's also the case. We have a number of members in the Caribbean and they're deeply concerned about the, about the situation. So it, it's, it's all over the world. This is, this is the issue. But it's not talked about in, 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 in the context of the direct effect on those very people. Mm -hmm. And people tend to be um concerned about maintaining their way of life um, whether you're talking about a tribe in Uganda or whether you're talking about the American dream people people want to keep their way of life do you think this might be an effective way to engage people with the issue of climate change well I hope so and I hope so and and um, the International National Trust organization has recently held its uh, biennial conference in, in Victoria in British Columbia uh, last month or in October and um, at that conference uh, we prepared what we call the, the Victoria Declaration and that was uh, unanimously approved by the 250 delegates of that conference, all representing one heritage organization or another. We've brought that Victoria Declaration here, we have our own stand and we are getting people to sign it. We've already had over 100 signatures, I think, to that uh, from all different organizations and individuals around the world. Um, we are ha holding a side event tomorrow um, on the North Beach in, in, um, in, in, a, in a pavilion there and uh, we are going to be promoting that. My chairman Simon Molesworth and I will both be speaking at that, at that side event and we are putting this message across and at every opportunity uh, if I get a chance to ask a question at a debate I will put this across. I spoke today to um, the Ecuadorian uh, I think he was called the Under, Under Minister of Culture from, the, from Ecuador about this very issue and he was extremely supportive and said yes you, you, we must do something about it. Uh, asked him if there were, because we are not represented in South America, I had a, I had a vested interest in, in hearing what he had to say about cultural organizations in Ecuador and um, he was extremely delighted to meet me and said yes we do have them and we do need to get them on board mm -hmm. so this was good news and are you seeing kind of this this aspect of, of the issue being picked up more and more are people starting to to recognize the impacts of climate change on on culture and on people's way of life and uh, is the momentum building i really believe that our presence here at cop 17 is is, is making a difference. Um, we've, we've got a stand, we've got volunteers manning our stand, um, and I think that we're, we're delivering a message. It's the first time that we've had a stand at any of the COPs that we've been to, and it's made an enormous difference, frankly, because so many people are passing by, it, we've decorated out our, our, our booth, we think rather well, we've just had it photographed by the UNFCCC Secretariat, actually, who thought it looked magnificent. And um, uh, people are stopping, they're, ta they're, you know, they're, they're, they're attracted by it. We've, we've got a visitor's book and we've got over 250 signatures in that already. So people are certainly interested in every single one of those who signed. We have talked to them about our position on climate change and cultures. Okay. And how do you see this panning out in the next kind of 10, 20, 30 years? Because as people's way of lives are affected, do you think there's going to be more engagement with this issue? Do you think people in rich countries are going to be impacted as well? Because for the, for the main part we hear about the impacts of climate change on, on, on people in poor communities, but what's it going to take to, to engage you know, those of us in, in Europe and North America who don't really believe in climate change? Well. You, that's a bit of a generalisation because, of course, there are there are strong adverse. Those of us in in North America, <laughs> not all of us, <laughs> not all of us, unfortunately. Uh, a minority, in fact, I think uh, the, the polling data shows. Probably, um, I mean, if you take the National Trust in the UK, in, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, for example, um, it is extremely aware of climate change and is suffering from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if you come to our booth, I can show you some photographs. Um, they, they they've got of properties with floods. Uh, Floods rising, um, the northwest of England, a year and a half ago I think it was, or two years now, uh, 
uh, had the most terrible floods, which um, struck one of our properties, Wordsworth, Wordsworth's birthplace, in fact, and that the, the, the whole of the ground, the, um, the bottom floor of that was completely submerged. Walls came down, and the whole thing was a nightmare. Um, that. That, that we are getting extreme weather conditions in the British Isles uh, like we've never seen before and uh, yes there are skeptics who will say that's nothing to do with climate change but you can't go on saying that frankly because it's it is happening it is real we are getting extremes of temperature There's, you can't deny that now why are we getting it why are we getting it that's the fundamental question and I suppose the skeptics don't believe that they just think it's cyclical maybe but I'm sorry, but I, I don't I don't hold on with that. And and unfortunately, we we do have still have a number of governments in the world who are not on board with the whole principle of climate change. And my message is that I just don't believe that uh, they can go on denying it indefinitely. I mean, the world is warming up, and that we have we are going to have real issues. As I said already, in Africa, people are dying on a daily basis. Um, directly resulting in climate change, the, the, the droughts, the floods, it's causing all sorts of problems for humans, human beings and their livelihoods. And if you just come here, I mean, I've heard, I went to a debate the other day, a debate, I went to listen to some African stories being told about these people who are, are suffering. And it, honestly, I mean, one of the speakers was in tears just telling the story of how her baby had died because of malnutrition as a result of floods and... and, 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 and and drought and just not being able to access the food and it's just heartrending frankly and I, I just don't think governments in the developed world can go on ignoring it indefinitely I just find it un unbelievable I, as I said to you when you interviewed me earlier in, in this conference uh, I have this issue with, about politicians because they're only there for the short term and we're here for the long term I mean the National Trust in, in England for example its motto is forever for everyone mm -hmm. now say that to a government minister and he only thinks about five years and whether he's going to have a job at the end of it you know I mean that that is the issue and are the politicians the right people to making these decisions they've got to think long term they've got to think not about this generation not about the next generation but about the generation after that and those beyond it's a very big problem it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out and it would be fascinating to talk with you again in the future and to, to get some more of these stories from around the world as to, to how climate change are impacting people we're going to go now to uh, an interview we recorded earlier with Steve Sawyer, who's from the um, Global Wind Energy Council. Um, he speaks with uh, an enormous amount of authority about these talks. I think he's attended ev almost every single one um, uh, since uh, 1992. This is an annual conference. Um, and he also knows a great deal about the uh, investment in renewable energies in China and in the US, um, who the big players are, um, and who is really going to benefit from this booming green economy. I think uh, investment in renewables uh, for the first time topped uh, investment in fossil fuels uh, so uh, we'll bring you that interview now and then we'll be uh, back live with us in the UN climate talks in Durban